On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including updates from the Hubble Space Telescope, a successful flight to the ISS for Axiom Space, bad news for Starbase development, Rocket Lab is ready to catch their first booster, and we learn about ice volcanoes on Pluto. So let's get going. This is the Space Race. The venerable Hubble Space Telescope has been hard at work making some pretty mind-blowing discoveries about the universe around us. Even though James Webb has taken over the hype train lately, Hubble is proving that its best days are still ahead. On March 30th, the Hubble telescope discovered a new star that is the furthest away from the Earth that we have ever seen. The newly detected star, which has been named Irendel, is so far away that its light has taken 12.9 billion years to reach Earth. We're pretty sure that our universe itself is about 13.7 billion years old, so the light from this star dates back to the infancy of the known universe, which is pretty trippy. Because light shifts further and further over the infrared spectrum as it ages, Irendel's age is set by its redshift factor, which in this case is 6.2. The previous record holder for oldest known star was a redshift factor of just 1.5, or about 4 billion years old. The reason that NASA observers were able to focus on a light source that was so far away was thanks to an anomaly called gravitational lensing. This is a very complicated bit of astrophysics, but in a simple sense, we are seeing a natural magnification of the light from Irendel that is being caused by a huge galaxy cluster directly in between the star and the Earth. The mass of the galaxy cluster actually warps the fabric of space, creating a lens effect that distorts and greatly amplifies the light from distant objects behind it. Thanks to the rare alignment with the magnifying galaxy cluster, the star Irendel appears directly on a ripple in the fabric of space, and this ripple provides maximum magnification and brightening. It's like, have you ever seen the sunlight seem to sparkle off ripples in a swimming pool? Same kind of idea, just with the fabric of space itself instead of water. Science is pretty cool. And this is also a great example of how the Hubble and the new James Webb Space Telescope can work in tandem to discover new things about our universe. So now that Hubble has discovered this new star, we know exactly where to point the James Webb for further observation. The enhanced infrared imaging capability on the web to measure the star's brightness, temperature, and composition. The findings from James Webb could help to confirm some long-held theories about the very first stars that were born after the Big Bang. And that's not even the only really amazing discovery that the Hubble telescope has made in the last week. On April 6th, Hubble observed some insane weather patterns on a new exoplanet that is categorized as a super hot Jupiter where rocks fall like rain. This particular Jupiter-sized world named WASP-178b is located so close to its host star that the temperature on the planet reaches over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, a temperature so high that it would vaporize metal and classify it as the hottest planet ever discovered. This ultra-hot environment creates some very bizarre weather patterns as well. So the close proximity to its star means that this particular hot Jupiter is tidally locked meaning that one side of the planet is permanently facing towards the sun, and the other side is always facing away. Half perpetual day, half perpetual night. This difference in temperature causes powerful super hurricane winds to whip around the planet at over 2,000 miles per hour, pulling silicon monoxide gas along with them. This gas is created by the insane heat actually vaporizing the rock on the day side of the planet. And then, when the gas reaches the night side, it cools down enough to re-solidify into rocks and then fall from the sky like rain. Let us know in the comments section if you want to see more of this scientific discovery style content on the channel. With all of the instruments that we are putting into space right now, there is going to be a deluge of this stuff to come. Axiom Space has successfully transported four civilian astronauts to the International Space Station inside a SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft. This mission, named Axe-1, marks the first ever private trip to the station. 
Now, it should be noted that the Axiom mission commander, Michael Lopez Alegria, is a former NASA astronaut and current Axiom employee who already spent time on the ISS back in 2006. So it's not like these were all purely amateur spacemen on board, but the three who accompanied him were simply customers who paid $55 million each to come along for the ride. But they're not up there just to gawk at the view. The four are scheduled to spend eight days on the ISS, conducting research and performing other commercial activities and outreach. The crew plan to carry out a range of experiments and investigations for organizations in Canada, Israel, and the United States. The Axe one crew will primarily live and work in what's known as the U.S. operational segment of the station, which includes NASA, European, and Japanese modules. The mission is a significant milestone for Axiom Space, which is preparing to fly a series of missions like Axe one to the ISS before installing their own commercial module on the station as soon as 2024. That module, and others added to it, will eventually allow the company to have a larger, potentially permanent presence on the ISS, and will serve as the core of Axiom's standalone commercial space station when the ISS is retired. We've got another bad news update for SpaceX again this week, and this is all centered around what is going on with development at Starbase Texas. We've just learned that the US Army Corps of Engineers has closed a permit application for a proposed expansion of SpaceX's Starbase facility in Boca Chica. This essentially nixes Elon Musk's plan to add new launch and landing pads to the area, as well as substantially grow the new spaceport. In a letter written to SpaceX, the Corps cited the company's failure to provide requested follow-up information about the proposed changes as a reason for closing the permit. Among other things, the Corps wanted more details about what mitigation measures the company would take to limit the loss of water and wetlands surrounding the site. This is a bit of a long story, but we'll try and get to the heart of the matter. The entire Starbase launch and landing area is just a few hundred feet away from Boca Chica Beach and the Gulf Coastline. The whole area around the launch site is half underwater, and on the two sides that aren't ocean, Starbase is surrounded by a wildlife management area and a state park. So it's a very environmentally sensitive location. As SpaceX continues to grow its infrastructure in Boca Chica, the company periodically amends an existing permit it holds with the Army Corps of Engineers, which ensures that the construction plans don't violate the Clean Water Act and the Rivers and Harbors Act. In December 2020, SpaceX proposed to modify its existing permit for a massive expansion that would include building two orbital launch pads, two suborbital launch pads, a new landing pad, and other major infrastructure changes. These additions would require SpaceX to backfill material into existing flats and wetlands, including 11 acres of mud flats, six acres of estuary wetlands, and one quarter acre of non-tidal wetlands. This significant change in the plan and expansion of the infrastructure opened up a period of public commentary, which allowed many environmentalist and animal activist groups to level significant protests against SpaceX activity. Once the comment period ended, the Corps sent a letter to SpaceX in May 2021 outlining the comments, which included responses from the EPA, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Corps itself, and Texas Environmental Protection Organizations. SpaceX was asked to address the comments as well as submit various documents, such as mitigation plans for avoiding impact to wetlands and offsetting the loss of aquatic resources, a plan for alternative construction that would provide the same purpose but provide lesser impacts to the area, and more. Basically, what's happened here is that SpaceX did not submit their homework. They didn't do what was asked of them. Because the Army Corps of Engineers never received the information that they requested, they went ahead and closed the application file on the SpaceX Starbase expansion. So, if we remember just a year or so ago, it had seemed like Elon Musk was ramping up to develop Starbase into some kind of a futuristic spaceport and private city that would be central in SpaceX operations. But 
Given this new information, that the company may have already lost interest in even expanding their orbital test pad, it's looking like that dream of a spaceport in South Texas is on hold. Keep your eyes on the skies April 19th because Rocket Lab will be attempting to make history and capture their Electron rocket booster stage with a helicopter after it returns from space. If successful, this would make Rocket Lab only the second aerospace company to retrieve their booster stage and not just allow it to sink into the ocean water. During launch, the first stage will propel the second stage and the mission's payload for about two and a half minutes before separating and beginning its coast back to Earth. The Electron rocket doesn't use its engines again after separation, unlike the Falcon 9, which performs a boost back burn in the upper atmosphere to slow down. Instead, Electron has to carefully slice through the air at high velocity, being careful not to rip itself apart with hot plasma. Once the booster reaches about 8 miles in altitude, it will deploy a drogue chute to start the process of slowing down. The speed will then decrease more dramatically when the main chutes deploy at 3.7 miles up. Moving at roughly 22 miles per hour, the booster will enter the recovery zone 150 miles off the coast of New Zealand. At that point, Rocket Lab's custom recovery helicopter will use a hook to latch onto the parachute's line in mid-air. Once the Electron booster is secured, it will be returned to land to be assessed for reuse. The mission named There and Back Again will be Rocket Lab's third Electron launch of the year and will bring the total number of payloads deployed to 146. Here's something that might blow your mind a little bit. So, we've always been taught to think of Pluto as a big ball of ice in the distant outer edge of the solar system. The former planet was downgraded to a dwarf planet status in 2006, and is famously the location where Arnold attempted to commit suicide on an episode of the Magic School Bus by removing his space helmet and traumatized a generation of young people. We had some dark shit back in the day. Anyway, we are now discovering a ton of new details about our far away neighbor Pluto, including the theory that it might not actually be frozen solid after all. When New Horizons flew 7,800 kilometers above the surface of Pluto, it revealed a world unlike anything we'd ever seen. There were flat plains, mountains, and even a thin atmosphere. It was far from the stagnant, blue, icy world that had been depicted in artists' impressions over the decades. It was an eye-opening discovery, and one of the most intriguing images sent back to Earth was one that suggests the possibility of ice volcanoes, also called cryovolcanoes. These volcanoes wouldn't be like what we know on Earth. Instead, they would be fed by water, ice, and other volatiles like nitrogen, methane, and carbon monoxide. Some of these volcanoes appear 7 kilometers tall and up to 150 kilometers wide. Instead of a violent eruption with lava, rock, and dust spewing into the sky, it's believed that the materials these volcanoes produce is likely some kind of slushy water ice and is brought to the surface slowly by some sort of internal heating mechanism. Researchers believe that these eruptions may have occurred as recently as 100 million years ago, and there's potential that they are still happening. But where does the heat come from? One theory is that it is radiating from the rocky core of the planet where elements break down and create byproduct heat that can remain trapped until it is released in some way. It could be that its relatively small core is creating this heat and then pushes up the mixture of water and nitrogen ice, and it's likely that there are other elements at play as well. The new study also suggests there may be an ocean 100 to 200 kilometers beneath Pluto's icy crust. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.